for participants and probably with other interested uh, uh, companies or other interested stakeholders. So, sorry, I it's not the start. Yeah, so uh, as Inura said, uh, actually we shared with you the survey and I will share again in chat. And uh, of course, if you haven't yet uh, uh, to, to work with this survey, uh, please do this. And uh, uh, if uh, you will do this after this webinar, please leave the comment that actually you, 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 you filled in this survey after the webinar because it could impact a little bit the results of the survey and we need to take it into consideration. But um, the key aim of the survey and uh, main aim of this webinar actually, uh, the main aim of this webinar is provide you with some uh, information and understanding from uh, from where this survey came and uh, what are the reasons to have this survey. And uh, as Inura said, uh, um, based on the results of this survey, we are going to develop uh, the next steps and to develop probably the recommendations for all kind of involved uh, actors, uh, what kind of uh, support or what kind of initiatives uh, could uh, help companies from our region to to be more competitive probably in um, in uh, in the context of uh, current uh, trends on corporate sustainability and um, and yeah to be more sure in 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 their capabilities and uh, to build uh, probably some uh, uh, initiatives together and to to support each other in in this journey so uh, what uh, we are going to discuss today and please feel free to raise your hand on or to ask in uh, the chat or to share your comments in the chat so I call you to 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 be open for for the discussion as much as possible. So we are going to discuss general trends on corporate sustainability and how these trends are linked to business and human rights uh, uh, agenda. And uh, it's not just uh, the European Union trend, but we will focus mostly on uh, the European Union regulation and uh, how it could impact uh, companies in our region. Uh, but uh, yeah, but we also will mention and we'll see that it's not just the European Union and the trend is much more broader. Uh, we will focus on uh, the European Union corporate sustainability due diligence uh, directive uh, and um, on uh, the connected uh, regu uh, regulatory initiatives in the European Union and in the national uh, jurisdiction. Uh, uh, because uh, again, uh, this directive should not be considered uh, as uh, in uh, isolation of other initiatives because all of them are very connected, and uh, it definitely makes sense uh, to to take into consideration these connections uh, and. Uh, and the key question is uh, what uh, what impact. Um, of the directive beyond the European Union and in particular in our region and uh, what companies can do and how companies can be supported to be uh, more prepared uh, for these um, trends. So, uh, of course, the directive and all other corporate sustainability initiatives uh, are based uh, on existing, uh, already existing uh, initiatives and frameworks. Uh, and um, some of you probably know and probably already faced with uh, uh, UN guidance principles on business and human rights, uh, OECD uh, guidelines uh, and uh, on, on responsible business Conduct and OECD guidance for multinational corporations, uh, um, and and many and, and actually uh, um, corporate sustainability initiatives are also connected uh, very much uh, uh, with. Uh, uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, so actually, uh, this is a Z 
general trends on sustainable development and how sustainable development is connected with international human rights standards and what different state and non-state actors should do to implement sustainable development goals. So, this is, uh, I would say, the, the, the general framework and uh, all these initiatives are connected uh, closely. So if uh, probably again, uh, probably some of you already know, uh, know uh, about UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, they were adopted in 2011 and um, uh, actually... Um, UN guiding principles on business and human rights actually provided the concept of uh, human rights due diligence and corporate responsibility to respect human rights and uh, OECD guidance uh, uh, were uh, uh, reconsidered uh, based on the UN guiding principles and also integrated uh, this approach. So if uh, you are, for example, aware with these uh, standards, uh, uh, the EU um, uh, Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive should not be uh, new for you because it's uh, uh, fully based on the same approach uh, and uh, it just provides, uh, I would say, more detailed approach because it's 100 and 30 pages uh, in, in the directive and it's a um, really detailed uh, document. Uh, I, I find it quite uh, clear written, so if you would be interested, I would recommend to read, not just for general understanding, but probably not uh, just, uh, not all <laughs> one, 130 pages. Uh, um, probably it's not possible to read in very short uh, term. Uh, that's why we have this webinar today to provide you with uh, the general understanding of what uh, the directive is about and uh, what probably uh, the key uh, provisions of directive which uh, you uh, which uh, you uh, need to have into consideration when you are thinking about um, uh, corporate sustainability of your own company, of your own chains of activity. So the directive uh, is part of uh, the general uh, um, sust sustainable European economy framework. Um, and uh, it uh, refers to many other initiatives in, in this uh, field. So, and, and of course it is connected with uh, sustainable corporate governance, uh, with um, uh, sustainable financing, with uh, circular economy, and it is uh, uh, the part of a European Green Deal. Uh, but um, oh, as uh, I said uh, in the beginning, uh, uh, we don't uh, uh, have only uh, uh, such kind of initiatives only in the European Union level. And uh, again, probably you already know that uh, the current uh, regulatory landscape uh, in business and human rights and in corporate sustainability and in human rights due diligence is much more broad. And you can see on this map uh, um, different kind of legislative initiatives in uh, uh, different countries and in different parts of the world. So um, you can see uh, initiatives in Canada, you can see uh, regulation in uh, the U.S. Uh, um, uh, of course, uh, on the national level uh, in uh, European Union member uh, states. Uh, we also have some uh, examples. Uh, France, uh, for example, adopted uh, the corporate duty of vigilance law in 2017. And... Um, 
we already have uh, some uh, experience of implementation this law um, and uh, uh, the, some organizations, expert organizations, civil society organizations are monitoring uh, the effectiveness of uh, this law. And uh, so uh, there are some developments there. In the Netherlands, uh, there is um, a Child Labor Due Diligence Act uh, adopted in 2019. Um, in, in Germany, I, I would say that probably it was uh, the most uh, significant step on the national level when uh, corporate due diligence in supply chain act uh, was adopted in 2021 and uh, companies uh, which uh, are part of uh, German companies uh, supply chains uh, uh, all already had a chance to 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 feel indirect effect of of this um, law. Um, so yeah, so there are some uh, initiatives in the world. I I should say that from the very beginning, um, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Uh, um, have tried to propose uh, um, the smart mix approach. Uh, it uh, it means that to to try to to find a good balance between hard uh, um, measures and soft measures, uh, and uh, it was uh, a hope that probably it would be enough. Uh, to have voluntary uh, initiatives uh, from businesses uh, to integrate uh, human rights and environment due diligence into their corporate practices. Uh, but um, the progress was uh, quite slow. Um, and um, when the European Commission um, st started uh, the discussion about uh, um, e e about um, the mandatory human rights due diligence for companies in the European Union. Actually, the European Commission uh, started with the survey, also with the survey for companies in the European Union. The survey was conducted in 2020 and, and actually the survey uh, um, aimed to, to indicate what companies thought about uh, uh, the perspective uh, of, um, uh, of implementation of mandatory human rights due diligence requirements to them. And uh, actually, most of companies uh, found uh, this uh, reasonable, uh, and and most of companies supported uh, that. Uh, uh, why? Uh, because uh, they found that uh, if uh, uh, we would have uh, the regulation on the European Union level, it would be much more certain way. Uh, to, to, to provide operations in different countries and it would be much more fair and uh, um, much more fair for those companies which uh, already implemented uh, um, corporate, uh, already implemented responsible conduct uh, uh, in voluntary base because uh, if we have uh, very oh, if we don't have such kind of regulation and uh, if we leave uh, this question just um, uh, to companies uh, uh, we, we have a situation when responsible companies are trying to integrate this approach to 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 to, to their corporate policies and practices but uh, other companies uh, uh, could uh, 
uses these uh, to to increase probably in some cases to increase their competitiveness because uh, they don't spend the money, uh, financial resources, human resources uh, to develop this approach, to integrate this approach, and probably they even can build their business strategies uh, on uh, irresponsible business models. Uh, for example, uh, they uh, could be interested to, to pay less money to their suppliers, knowing that uh, uh, suppliers, because of that, are not able to, to pay um, decent wages uh, to to employees or to provide them with uh, sufficient equipment uh, or to provide them with uh, safe working conditions so um yeah so uh, the the main argument for companies which supported uh, the idea to develop this kind of regulation uh, was uh, that uh, it would be um much more fair for responsible companies uh, to have uh, this uh, kind of regulation and also uh, it 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 would provide us uh, with much more certain um rules on on the market and of course uh, the general idea is uh, to ensure um, respect for human rights uh, and to ensure that uh, we are on the same page in understanding what kind of uh, actions could be implemented by companies uh, to, to ensure uh, respect for human rights. Um, and um, as I said, actually, Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive uh, uh, goes uh, to, together with a number of other initiatives on the European Union level, uh, in particular deforestation regulation. It was uh, post uh, for one uh, year now, just last week, uh, so it already should be implemented by uh, states, but uh, it was post, but uh, um, of course, uh, it's uh, bad news that it was posed, but at the same time, it was adopted uh, by the European Union. And the uh, main idea of this regulation is that uh, um, European uh, Union companies uh, should be uh, sure that um, in their uh, supply chains um, um, there is no negative impact uh, on uh, on uh, um, the forest uh, beyond of uh, the European Union. So uh, there is a list of uh, products and uh, commodities. Uh, and uh, uh, if uh, a company uh, um, su supplies these uh, goods or commodities, uh, which uh, which are linked with high risks to deforestation, um, companies should provide uh, uh, geolocation of uh, the place from um, of the place of origin of these goods and commodities, and uh, no, actually to provide evidences that. Uh, there is no negative impact uh, to to the forest uh, on on this uh, t territory related to these goods and uh, commodities. So it's also uh, about due diligence um, uh, in uh, in in some uh, context. Um, also, there is a regulation on prohibiting products made with uh, forced labor. Um, and uh, this regulation uh, is uh, still, uh, the adoption of this regulation is still under process, but on the very final uh, stage. And uh, uh, it also ha uh, has a direct reference uh, on uh, due diligence, uh, which should uh, um, aim uh, uh, on avoiding of any risk uh, that uh, products um, which uh, are going to 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 be um imported into the European Union market was uh, uh, 
productive uh, with the using of forced uh, labor. And, and also there is a link with uh, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, uh, Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive uh, has uh, a direct reference uh, to the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive and uh, uh, actually it was uh, an aim uh, of uh, European policymakers uh, to, to avoid duplication of requirements uh, addressed to companies uh, and uh, so corporate sustainability due diligence directive expects from companies that they report uh, about uh, their due diligence steps, about the monitoring of effectiveness of these uh, measures, uh, but uh, for reporting uh, there is no um, additional requirements than um, corporate sustainability reporting directive uh, has so in this case uh, these two directives are in line uh, to 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 each other um and uh, no, just uh, to, to mention that from the very beginning, Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive was titled uh, in uh, another way. Uh, it was uh, Human Rights and Environment Due Diligence Directive. Uh, uh, but uh, then uh, to be more, um, I would say, uh, probably business-oriented or uh, not, not so... As uh, scary for for business people, uh, and also to be in line with uh, reporting directive, uh, uh, it was uh, um, uh, made a decision uh, to. To, to actually to to agree uh, these directives um, to each other and uh, to to have the same. Uh, approach and to have the same title, corporate sustainability due diligence and corporate sustainability report. And because uh, probably if uh, you know uh, uh, that um, a reporting directive had also another title, non-financial directive before. Um, so actually, uh, what is a directive about and how does it affect companies beyond the European Union? Uh, um, this, uh, um, yeah. So this directive uh, is about two main uh, points, I would say. The first one uh, is about human rights and environment due diligence. So companies uh, should uh, develop uh, the process of uh, human rights and environment due diligence, not just in uh, its own operations, but also in the operations of its uh, subsidiaries and uh, in operations uh, carried out by business partners in chains of uh, activities or chains of actions. N so it's also interesting, we will be back to this uh, term, that uh, the directive doesn't um, use um, the term of value chains or supply chains and um, uses the term chains of activities. Uh, um, and uh, the second point, uh, transition plan uh, to mitigate the consequences of climate change. Uh, so companies uh, should uh, develop uh, the number of actions which will be implemented uh, um, uh, for, for 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 reducing uh, global warming to uh, one point five um, um, degrees. So, uh, but uh, mostly the directive uh, focuses on uh, human rights and environment due diligence, but also has a sp special provisions related to transition plan uh, and climate change. Change. Um, what uh, companies does the directive cover? Um, uh, the, the directive uh, covers uh, the EU directly, covers the EU companies and non-EU companies. Um, so uh, the, the EU companies will be covered directly if uh, a company has more than 1,000 employees and uh, net turnover over than 
450 million euros for the last fiscal year. Um, and uh, actually, um, this criteria um, uh, should be um, uh, uh, sh should be met uh, during uh, two last uh, previous fiscal year. So, if uh, uh, during uh, uh, if in one of these uh, years company didn't uh, meet this uh, criteria, it means that uh, uh, it will not be covered by uh, the directive. For non-EU companies, um, the criteria related to uh, number of employees uh, uh, is not applied uh, to non-EU companies and only criteria related to net turnover uh, is applied. But also there is one more difference uh, if we talk about EU companies, uh, uh, we talk about the mm, net turnover all over the world uh, but when we talk about non-EU companies we talk about just about net turnover in the European Union. Uh, it's uh, still uh, um, it's still uh, Mm, not clear, uh, not fully clear how uh, this uh, turnover for non-EU companies will be calculated uh, uh, be because uh, at the moment there is no uh, instrument uh, to, to indicate uh, net turnover for the non-EU companies in the EU um, and the directive provides um, the, the the provision that uh, this kind of non-EU companies should have a representative in the uh, European Union and this representative should inform um, uh, the authorities in the European Union about uh, um, uh, the turn, uh, net turnover in the EU, but uh, how it will be implemented, it's still um, under question. So, um, yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, we we should take into consideration that uh, actually companies have uh, enough time uh, to 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 prepare themselves uh, to to this uh, regulation because uh, um, the directive entered into force. Um, this year in July, in uh, 25th of July, um, but uh, uh, the directive has a so-called transposition period uh, for two years. So member states, uh, the EU member states, uh, should develop uh, the national mechanism uh, of uh, transposition of this directive. So they actually should develop the national mechanism of uh, um, application of implementation of the directive uh, um, and um, uh, and after that just uh, science uh, of uh, 2027 uh, the biggest companies uh, which uh, which have uh, no, for EU companies which have uh, 5,000 employees and uh, um, one and a half million uh, uh, turnover and uh, for non-EU companies uh, um, one and a half million uh, turnover in the EU. This directive will be applied, uh, and and then is for the next stage, uh, uh, companies uh, uh, a, a little bit uh, um, uh, small companies uh, will be covered by the uh, directive and only in 2029 all companies which are covered by the directive so one uh, one uh, uh, thousand employees and uh, 450 million turnover uh, will be um, uh, covered by the directive. But uh, this is true. Um, this is true about direct implication of the directive and the companies which uh, 
um, covered by the directive or which are in the supply chains of uh, this kind of companies, they uh, all re they have already started uh, um, to their uh, preparedness uh, started to ensure their preparedness to this uh, regulation because they uh, actually w wanted to, to, to be prepared much uh, more earlier than uh, the regulation uh, will be uh, applied. So they uh, um, have already tried to, to, to develop uh, um, the processes, the corporate processes and policies which will be in line with uh, the directive. Oh, sorry, I don't know why it's... Yeah. Um, so at this moment, uh, now our uh, colleagues from some experts organization in the EU calculated how many companies uh, in the EU will be covered by the directive. You can see 5,421 company uh, in the EU will be covered directly by the directive. But what about uh, non-EU uh, companies? So actually, as I said before, there is no way uh, to, to calculate um, uh, a certain number of um, non-EU companies at the moment because uh, there is no mechanism to know um, net turnover of non-EU companies in the EU, but um, with some indirect calculations, uh, the experts made uh, uh, a conclusion that uh, it will be around uh, 900 companies. But uh, as I said before, uh, this is about direct application of uh, the directive. But these companies will be obliged by, uh, by the directive uh, to indicate uh, and uh, to monitor and uh, to assess uh, human rights and environment risk in their chains of activity. And it means that in, in direct way, the directive will be applicable to companies uh, who are business partners or suppliers uh, who are in the uh, chains of activities of this uh, 5,421 European Union uh, companies and 900 non-European Union companies. Of course, these numbers could uh, uh, change because uh, uh, from year to year we can have different number of companies which will meet uh, the criteria which uh, the directive provides us. But uh, for the for our general understanding, this is uh, actually what uh, is the scope of uh, uh, directive. But also we um, should take into consideration that the directive provides us with the minimum expectations and um, the European Union member states could not go with lower uh, standards, uh, but they could um, propose the higher standards for for companies. So they also could have more broader scope of application, more broader number of companies uh, uh, to, to, to address them, these requirements. And also we need to take into consideration that actually uh, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights and the OECD approach and actually the directive has the same approach. Uh, they based on the idea that, of course, corporate responsibility to respect human rights and human rights due diligence should be applicable to all kind of companies uh, uh, to um to small, uh, medium, and big uh, companies, uh, uh, to companies in all uh, uh, regions, to companies which operate in all kinds of contexts, which companies from different economic sectors. So it means that uh, the directive uh, provides us with uh, some kind of 
compromise uh, and uh, it proposes uh, to, to 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 apply this uh, mandatory human rights and environment due diligence just to very large companies but uh, it doesn't mean that uh, smaller companies should not uh, have the same approach but the hope is that if we will go with large companies and their chains of activities that it will it could be enough uh, to to change the general corporate practice and to make uh, human rights due diligence uh, uh, the common practice for companies uh, without um, without introduction of the mandatory human rights due diligence for all kind of uh, companies. Uh, chains of uh, activity. Actually, the directive provides us with the definition and uh, the directive uh, covers upstream and downstream uh, chains of activities. Uh, you can also find um, actually uh, the definition of chains of activities on our uh, slide. We will provide you with them, uh, with some examples, and also in uh, the text of uh, directive, if you um, will be interested to, to, to read the whole text. So you can see, actually, that the, there is a whole um, circle of um, uh, of product or of uh, services should be covered by uh, by uh, human rights and environment due diligence. Um, some key points uh, of, of the directive and of the approach that it uh, proposes. So uh, the directive doesn't uh, provide us with uh, any new international standards for responsible business conduct or for business and human rights. It is based on existing uh, standards. So as I said before, if you are already aware with uh, the UN guiding principles uh, or with the OECD standards, uh, actually you uh, will not find something extremely new uh, for, for you in, in the directive because the approach is, uh, is absolutely the same um, but with some additional details, with some additional tools, instruments and the explanations. Um, uh, then we also uh, need uh, uh, to, to, to remember uh, that the directive is based uh, again on the same principle uh, as uh, the UN guiding principles do uh, that uh, the human rights due diligence is not about uh, obligation of uh, results it's about obligation of measures so what what does it mean it means that uh, uh, the directive doesn't expect uh, the ideal scenario that uh, uh, companies are able to to prevent any kind of negative impact uh, on human rights or environment in in their operations or in their chains of activities. Uh, it, it, it's not reasonable expectation, and uh, of course. Um, Every everybody understands that a negative impact could happen, but what uh, the directive expects uh, the directive expects that uh, companies uh, uh, do their best efforts and reasonable efforts uh, to 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 prevent this kind of uh, to, to prevent negative impact on human rights and uh, environment and uh, uh, so and and that's why uh, we are talking about uh, the obligation of measures not results so um when we assess uh, uh the, the company's conduct uh, in terms of uh, uh, 
in, in terms of responsible business conduct or in terms of corporate sustainability, uh, we assess what kind of efforts company uh, made to, to indicate, to identify uh, human rights and environment risk, to prevent uh, a negative impact on human rights and environment, to minimize uh, this impact, uh, to communicate with uh, stakeholders, to communicate with business partners, to to mitigate uh, risks and, and, and so on. Um, and uh, also um, companies leverage so the possibility to influence on, on the situation or to influence on business partners' conduct uh, also should be taken into consideration because different companies have different leverage. Uh, and, and of course, large companies usually have uh, much more strong leverage than small companies. Uh, uh, also, it should, in in some context, uh, the leverage could be linked to the status of the company. Is this state-owned companies or is this private-owned companies? Can this company uh, would say um, exit from uh, relation from business relationship, which could be very risky in terms of human rights or environment uh, or or not? No, so yeah, in each individual in each specific cases, it should be taken into consideration. Did uh, a particular company? have uh, a leverage to to impact into the situation in positive way or not uh, and with what instruments and and so on uh, also uh, the directive uh, pays a lot of attention to meaningful stakeholder engagement so this is a cross cutting element of human rights due diligence and uh, of course if a company uh, really wants to know what kind of human rights risk environment the risk could raise in its operations or in operations of its chains of activities. Of course, the uh, the meaningful stakeholders engagement is uh, the most important, the most uh, significant uh, instrument uh, to to know that. And the uh, company should again should make uh, reasonable efforts uh, to. Um, uh, to, to provide stakeholders with uh, channels of communications, with channels of notifications, uh, uh, with uh, um, instruments uh, to, to, to claim if, uh, if uh, some negative impact uh, uh, happened. Uh, and uh, these channels, of course, should be accessible, should be uh, uh, in, in time, sh 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 should take into consideration, again, uh, the content context uh, uh, in um, where companies operate and, and so on. So it also should be done in um, a reasonable way. Uh, so, yeah. And uh, uh, no, actually, what uh, are the basic expectations of the directive to companies? The basic expectation is that companies uh, integrate uh, uh, human rights and environment due diligence into policies and management systems, uh, they uh, identify and assess uh, the adverse impacts on human rights and environment. Uh, they uh, make all uh, reasonable efforts to prevent, uh, to minimize uh, uh, the actual or potential um, impact uh, on human rights and environment. They uh, evaluate and monitor the effectiveness uh, of uh, implemented measures they communicate about results and they provide remediation if uh, something negative happened. Um, as for communication, actually, mm, companies uh, globally and uh, in our region in, in, in particular, uh, actually, they are much more aware with uh, communication, with reporting, than with uh, human rights and environment due diligence. And um, uh, sometimes, uh, or even uh, often, uh, um, companies 
prefer to to report uh, that they don't have uh, any kind of human rights uh, risks in their operations and in operations of their chains of activities uh, uh, so they uh, uh, no, of um, mo more common situations than they don't uh, report about uh, uh, cases of the negative impact on human rights and environment in their uh, activities. But uh, uh, the evidence uh, uh, evidences show that if company uh, if a company provides this kind of information that uh, it indicated uh, human rights risks or it indicated a negative impact on human rights and environment in its own operations or in operations of uh, its um, chains of activities, it uh, in increases uh, the trust to these companies, uh, uh, trust from uh, investors, trust of uh, stakeholders, uh, because uh, no, this is the, the much more real situation uh, when company actually indicated something and also company reported how this situation was solved, what kind of measures were taken and what company actually did to prevent this kind of situation for the future and uh, what kind of remedies uh, were provided uh, to uh, to, to, to you know, for, for people or communities uh, uh, whose rights were uh, violated or were negatively impacted. Um, uh, if you already saw before this uh, picture, it means uh, that you uh, are already aware with uh, human rights due diligence process because this, this picture is taken from the OECD guidelines, but uh, the process um, of human rights and environment due diligence, uh, which uh, is provided by the directive, is um, the same as I already said before. So actually we have the same uh, steps uh, uh, that uh, companies uh, should de de develop policy uh, commitment. Uh, they should assess actual and potential impact. They should take actions uh, to address uh, impact. They should track performance. They should communicate performance and th they should provide remedy and grievance mechanisms. And uh, the cross-cutting element of human rights due diligence is um, a stakeholder uh, engagement. Um, in effective way, not in a formal way, but uh, to be sure that uh, stakeholders are involved in effective uh, way. Um, and uh, also, uh, directive uh, provides uh, some um, concrete uh, instruments which uh, company could uh, uh, could use uh, to 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 integrate uh, uh, human rights due diligence in particular in their supply chains uh, and uh, uh, for, for for example, the directive uh, mentions that uh, contractual assurance uh, uh, could could be used or should be used by companies uh, um, in uh, um, agreements in. Um, uh, contracts with uh, their direct business partners, but also uh, to to ensure that uh, the company's code of uh, conduct uh, uh, we, we will be uh, uh, part of uh, um, of re of business relationships uh, in in the whole chain of uh, uh, activity. So. And, and actually, the European Commission uh, is obliged by the um, directive to develop um, uh, the methodological recommendations or guidance uh, on um, uh, contractual uh, assurances or model contract uh, co co causes uh, and um, the draft of this kind of guidance uh, uh, is already developed by expert community, so there is no guarantee that the European Commission will take uh, this particular draft, but uh, the chances that uh, 
actually this draft will be taken into considerations are very high. So if you are interested, we will add uh, the link uh, to, to, to the draft of this contractual uh, co causes um, uh, to, to, to the slides and then we will share with you and um, you, you can see what kind of uh, uh, con contractual assurance could be uh, used. Uh, and also, uh, the directive pays a lot of attention to to uh, to small and medium enterprises. Uh, small and medium enterprises are not covered by the directive di directly, but uh, as we understand uh, uh, that uh, small and medium enterprises uh, could be part of uh, chains of activities of those companies which are covered by the directive. And it means that these companies will receive uh, uh, from uh, from their partners uh, the requests about uh, what kind of human rights risks they have, what uh, uh, kind of measures they uh, take to minimize this risk and, and so on and so forth. And um, it was a concern during uh, the discussion about the directive that small and medium enterprises could be impacted in negative way by the directive because uh, large companies uh, could uh, try to to put uh, the burden of implementation of this directive into small and medium enterprises or to other their business partners uh, and and the directive um, is trying to avoid uh, this situation and uh, it uh, has uh, direct provisions that large companies should make uh, necessary financial and non-financial investments and in particular uh, they should uh, uh, consider how they can uh, support uh, small and medium enterprises which are business partners of uh, this company probably to provide them with uh, the resources, with knowledge, with uh, trainings uh, or even uh, to provide them with uh, uh, financial uh, support, uh, low interest loans uh, uh, or any other kind of assistance so again uh, uh, the, the same request uh, to to support small and medium enterprises is uh, addressed by the directive to uh, to the states but uh, also to the large uh, companies that they should consider how they can support small and medium enterprises because uh, if they want to minimize uh, human rights and environment risk in their chains of activities, they should support their business partners in implementation measures which will minimize this kind of risks. And in many cases, the conduct of large companies is a key reason of this kind of risk, just because large companies could have the business model not to pay a lot you know, to business partners and not to give them financial possibility to minimize human rights risk so it could be a business model and uh, so the, the the idea is to avoid this kind of situation and to protect actually um, uh, employees uh, and um, of small and medium enterprises and uh, uh, local communities from this kind of business uh, conduct um, and the directive has uh, three main enforcement mechanisms. So uh, the uh, supervisory authorities uh, in each member state will be responsible and uh, they uh, um, will be able to impose uh, sanctions and fines to companies. And also there is a civil liability regime um, um, and also companies are required to provide or to participate uh, uh, in notification and compliant procedures accessible to aff sorry to um, affected uh, uh, individuals or communities including beyond the European uh, Union. Uh, what does it mean to participate? It means uh, that uh, multi 
multi actors, multi stakeholders initiatives are very welcome by the directive. So if uh, uh, so, company doesn't need uh, to 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 do, to develop uh, own uh, notification mechanism or own complaint mechanism. Companies could. Um, uh, combine uh, could uh, combine their, uh, their efforts uh, to implement directives. They could have joined uh, notification mechanisms. They could have uh, joined complaint mechanisms. Uh, they could develop uh, this kind of mechanism for the whole chain of activities, uh, uh, and uh, it, it could be much more um, efficient, uh, effective. Uh, um, to, to have this kind of mechanism for the whole chain of activities then uh, individually for each company. So uh, no, the, 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 the general um, idea is that uh, actually the directive calls uh, to think about uh, joint initiatives, multi-stakeholders initiatives, how company uh, companies um, uh, can cooperate with civil society organizations to obtain uh, information about human rights risks or to provide stakeholders with uh, um, information and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the directive uh, provides uh, uh, with a number of uh, tools, as I already said. So just to sum up uh, that uh, um, the European Commission during next two years will develop guidelines uh, and resources uh, to, to support companies uh, in the EU and non-EU companies uh, to, to implement uh, this uh, approach in their corporate uh, policies and practices. And, and also the European Union and European member states uh, will try to implement this approach in international uh, trade agreements with other countries and to call them in this way uh, to, to support their companies uh, to, to implement this approach as well. Uh, then... Um, uh, the, there are measures to support uh, small and medium enterprises and, uh, as uh, I already said, uh, fair contractual guarantees. Uh, and uh, all this could be used by non-European companies uh, to 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 um, raise their preparedness uh, to 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 this uh, trend. So actually, the main idea is to enhance their own due diligence processes and raise uh, human rights standards and demonstrate uh, their efforts uh, publicly. Uh, then, doing this, uh, they could become uh, more att attractive, more competitive to European Union business partners uh, uh, because they will seek uh, to minimize the risks in their uh, chains of activities and also uh, responsible investors will um, seek this kind of companies to invest uh, um, and, and also uh, corporate sustainability due diligence directive could be used by uh, non-EU companies uh, to negotiate uh, more fair contract terms with European Union companies uh, and uh, actually it could be used uh, as a call to, 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 to secure more, more fair contract terms uh, to be in line with uh, the directive and to promote responsible uh, conduct to to promote uh, um, fair uh, working conditions uh, for own employees uh, and and um, other responsible practices. Uh, I also want to share with you that uh, last year we published uh, this uh, study which uh, was conducted uh, by uh, UNDP uh, and it was um, uh, focused on uh, UN guiding principles on business and human rights in Europe and Central Asia in our region. Uh, and you can find, uh, I think, uh, um, 
relevant information because uh, uh, actually this study is very connected with corporate sustainability um, issues. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, I will finish uh, here. And um, yeah, so it's just uh, three of us, but yeah, if you have questions or comments, I will be glad to respond.